Hello, it's Scott Manley here with Eve or Bust, episode 6. Now, if you remember, during the previous launch, we had a major structural failure which destroyed a docking port, but due to the magnificent skills of Bob and Jebediah Kerman, they were able to bring the stricken vehicle into orbit and continue the mission. It was decided that given the cost involved, that they would continue to work on the mission with the damaged vehicle, so we are launching a repair, a spare part, let's say. A part designed to dock onto the back and provide the three docking ports we need instead of the two that we actually have. Now, the idea is we have to dock this over the existing vehicle, and that means we need to dock the large port and the small port simultaneously. And to do that, and we also have to dock them accurately with no rotation, so to do that we are using these um, support, these guide structures based, built out of cubic octagonal struts. And the idea is that this should just fit over the rear of the vehicle. Obviously I built this in the, in the vehicle assembly building with um, this attached and then removed the spare part using the sub-assembly loader, which has been confirmed for the next release. Oh my goodness, yes. That will no doubt make sub-assembly manager completely redundant, but nevertheless, we appreciate everybody that has ever worked on it. But that does also mean that, you know, I should point out to anyone, if you're creating mods, please create a software license so that if you get bored, we know what we can do with your mod. If you don't have a software license, we just, you know, we end up deleting them ultimately. Anyway, so we have to kind of slide this onto the back and make sure the parts all go together. Those parts may look big, but they are made of cubic octagonal struts. So, you know, it's maybe half a ton, maybe 0.6 tons there. So that's as we got everything slid up and they all join up. And if we right click, right click, we see undock. Therefore, those two ports are actually joined and we are all set up. This was a successful spare part installation. Going to transfer some fuel over and uh, do a little bit of EVA flying just to verify. Oh my goodness, the damage looks terrible from out here. Uh, but this one looks good. Hopefully that will hold under the force. You see, if we used a single port, then it would be liable to flex. That's why having two ports is a good plan. Now let's pose for a shot outside. Uh, where are you? Come on, get in front of it. Get in front. Yes, there you go. You you are terrible to photograph. You know that? You should try taking some lessons in modeling, sir. I know you're a rocket scientist, rocket pilot, but uh, modeling is an important skill for people that are representing their nation's, uh, indeed, their entire planet's dreams. you got to look good doing it. Anyway, now we're trying to get into an orbit that matches our um, the EESS lander. That is the critical part to this mission. We have to dock with that because if it gets damaged, if it does not make it to the surface, the entire mission is over. We will be returning home. I, I mean, I guess if we got there and it blew up on landing, we could still visit Gilly, but we certainly couldn't send our, our lab or our submarine to the surface because of the... The the fact is that we doom the Kerbals to remain stuck on Eve until we could send a mission to them. Right? So, well, what we're going to just try and do, we've got that set up. We're just going to try and adjust our orbit to bring them close. You see how we're going to swing down very close to the atmosphere. Just, uh, this is the danger when you're maneuvering an orbit. Is you don't want to re-enter the atmosphere by blindly following maneuver nodes. You have to remember the limits which your spacecraft can manage. So by making a small adjustment here, we should be coming up really closely to the vehicle. 1.1 kilometers, it says. So I'm just going to make some adjustments as I slide inwards here. We're going to make... Here we go. I, you know, I really want this thing to build clickable. Right now, you can click on the, the Apple uh, Apple apps and the Perry apps, but um, you can't do that for the close approach markers. It'd be really nice to just click on the close approach marker so you could adjust those without having to mouse back and forth like I'm doing here. Yes, this is another time for Benny Hill music brought on by UI that needs a little bit of work, let's say. So, yep, turn around, point at the blue marker, and ready to fire. Should only be a small burn. Even though we have um, 
we have a spacecraft which has only two nuclear engines and it is going to mass quite a lot in the end. I believe the final acceleration will be less than one meter per second. So we have to be careful. Well, we're going to have to use multiple passes to escape the planet Kerbin. And hopefully the frame rate won't be too terrible. Now, this entire thing is now moved into the realm of post-commentary because, frankly, everything is now running way too slowly to be interesting to watch the whole thing for reals. So I have to more or less fly this for you and then report back the victorious... or the <laughs> report the victories back to you in paraphrased, super-fast style. I'm even editing chunks out of this. This, is, this represents about four hours of gameplay between these various missions in this video, so and that's going to be less than a quarter of an hour of, of content. That's uh, one of the things about Kerbal Space Program, is you spend a lot of time you know, waiting around, being unable to do anything. So yeah, docking these things together is relatively easy because we're just using the two meter adapters. We just, uh, it, it sits on top. The only danger is that when you're docking, you don't want to come and do fast because of course, you may end up smashing those nice solar panels all over the side of that uh, launcher. And that would not be good for the health of the launcher or for the solar panels for that matter. I mean, truth be told, you don't really need that many solar panels, but they do look rather nice, I think. Um, I find it a shame that there's really very few things other than ion engines that need a lot of solar panels. So generally you can get away a lot of the time with a single solar panel and a nice big battery. But uh, I'm forever looking for excuses to fit giant solar arrays onto spacecraft. But yes, look, we have now a much larger and more complex vehicle. And this, now we need to use this entire vehicle, which is still stable, to hunt down and dock with the um, the rover, which, if you remember, I did launch into orbit with a little bit of a spin here and there. Bob and Jebediah are, of course, in command here and know what they're doing. Notice that I'm using the RCS along with the nuclear engines because although the RCS thrust is relatively low, it is st it's actually quite significant when you compare it against the thrust of these nuclear engines. And given that we're going to need like a thousand kilom a thousand meters per second, it is going to take us about half an hour of accelerating. And because it's such a long time that it takes us to get up to speed, we're actually going to have to spread our escape over multiple orbits if we're going to make it as efficient as possible. So, you know, once we start getting close to the, um, the correct EVE window, we're going to have to go one after the other. We're going to have to, like, burn in one orbit, come around again and keep burning until we get onto a nice escape trajectory. Otherwise, uh, you just end up wasting a lot of time burning against gravity and spiraling outwards slowly until, the, until you're able to actually get onto an escape trajectory. And yes, here's me faffing around with that again. Let's cut that all out because it would take forever. It, t it took a really long time to try and optimize this encounter down to zero. And in fact, I think I over-optimized my encounter down to zero and almost collided. Um, but yeah, 24 meter per second burn. You can actually see how long this takes once I get down there. Node in D minus two minutes. There we go. So you can count once I start the, the node how long it thinks it's going to take. Actually, it says estimated burn is 23 seconds and the burn is 24 meter per second burn. So our acceleration is just over one meter per second, but we're going to have to have two 25 ton objects added to this. So that'll bring our mass up quite significantly and drop our actual acceleration down below the one meter per second regime which isn't a problem i mean with probes it's a lot easier with the ion engines because you can literally just leave those on autopilot and use time acceleration when you have something like this you can't really use physical time acceleration because it will cause the vehicle to flex and break and explode and all sorts of other hilarious things that uh, generally wouldn't happen with real physics acceleration but the physics acceleration is not um I don't know, I guess it's it's not 100% accurate compared to real physics acceleration. I'm not sure what real physics acceleration is, to be honest, but it would be nice to have it in the game so that when, when you do uh, time acceleration, things don't magically explode and fall apart. Okay. So, yeah, we're coming down. We're going to have to make a hundred and something meter per second burn, and since we're a long way out, we're going to start extra, extra early. Estimated burn is going to be 1 minute and 43 seconds, and we do not want to overshoot this thing, so we want to actually accelerate early. 
This is because we went and did one of these eccentric orbits to catch up with it quickly. We're going to have to do a quite an aggressive rendezvous burn here. And the danger is if you make it too late and you are not accurate, or you are too accurate, you could actually fly into the spacecraft at quite, uh, quite a velocity. Which again would not be good for spacecraft. Spacecraft collisions do actually happen in real life. There was a case of a satellite that was destroyed by, uh, and was a couple of satellites collided and formed a really nasty cloud of debris. And of course, we had the Progress uh, shuttle, the Progress cargo ship, crashed into the Mir space station. Although that was flown by an actual cosmonaut. What happened during that Progress? crash was that they wanted to try docking I think without the radar system they wanted to just use the TV feed and well part of the problem with the TV feed was it was kind of noisy and grainy and they were trying to dock with a space station that was um, the earth was behind it so you had a very bright object in front of a or a very a bright object in front of a bright object so it, it was very hard to actually see where everything was and yeah at this point I realized oh I might actually collide here, so I actually make some corrective maneuvers to make sure that I come alongside it. And as I say, I, I kind of overcompensated a little here, but <laughs> it's better to be safe than sorry, right? Yeah, coming alongside it, we, we get into it within about uh, 150 meters here. 150 meters is just a little too far, I was hoping to get a little closer, but... We, we're here, we pull our velocity down to essentially nothing. My maneuver node says I still have 32 meters per second. Ignore that. Maneuver nodes don't adapt qu well to changing situations. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna just, we just brought this in close and we're gonna, we're gonna skip over the actual approach because this takes a really long time. The thing handles like a very, very, very heavy thing that doesn't handle very well. But uh, the RCS is relatively good. One of the problems is actually that the RCS is on the main spacecraft and not on the... Um, it's not on the top, on the launcher, EESS. EESS does not have any RCS system on it because, of course, that adds weight, and weight is hugely important when you're trying to launch anything off of EVE. So it has this big, heavy mass on the front, and all the engines are at the back, so you can imagine that this thing just wants to spin around and torque whenever you fire it. Thankfully, it's a little more stable thanks to the ESAS or the SAS system that is built into the game. It works relatively well. Of course, still using the docking adapter, um, the docking aligner, alignment system for by Navy Fish. What we want to do is make sure we line this thing up right. If we have it the wrong way, then those wheels might get in the way of nuclear engines. And of course, we all know that wheels don't like being blasted by... Um, you know, nuclear exhaust. Uh, the other thing to realize is that the, although we've set control from the docking port, it doesn't care. It still is showing me, the the nav ball is still showing me relative to the center of mass. It would be a really nice thing to fix, Mr. Um, developer, sir. I hope you had a wonderful time at PAX. Uh, I would really like to go one of these days, but, you know, Labor Day, family, all that, very, very important. We had a lot of fun, um, you know, in the lakes and all that burning things as well. Hay rides. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, dock, dock, dock. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, wait, completely on the wrong side here. Um, let's try... What should we do? Oh, come on. Come back here. Get on there. Okay, let's try and rotate this thing towards it. No! Okay, apparently... Apparently this thing is not... It's not turning the way I expected it to. That's not good. No engines on it, of course, other than the engines that are on the wheels that will move the vehicle around over the surface of EVE as we explore it in our quest for more scientific data on the planet that is Kerbin's nearest neighbour. But right now, Jebediah and Bob are mostly concerned with this nearest neighbour in that they are trying to dock with it. And it is not complying with their wishes. It's just kind of floating around there. If they could just keep it pointed the right way using those reaction wheels, it would probably be really helpful. It's uh, really not designed to be... Neither of these things are designed to be docked to each other. I originally had planned that these things would all be on separate ships, but somebody wanted to see one giant ship with everything on it. And I think it will probably be the death of my PC if the frame rate is anything to judge by. 
There we go, at least. And um, another thing that I had not originally thought of is that the braces that hold the spacecraft together, um, they're very close to that port, so I'm going to have to come up with some way to dock my lander, my secondary spaceship. Anyway, the other spacecraft is, of course, the, the submarine. It is easy enough to launch, just your standard rocket stack. I just put the Rockamax engines on the side. I was not going for efficiency here. And indeed, I'm not going for style either, it's just kind of flopping around like a fish out of water, or rather a fish arcing into the sky, swimming upstream against the current that is gravity. Um, so yeah, we've got Flight Engineer plugged on here, mostly because I forgot to take it off, to be honest. It's just giving me information. Whoa, wow. No, well, great. Okay, that did not work so well. Um, this thing appeared to be rather unstable, but nevertheless, with a bit of work, it, it had, at least, despite that uh, interruption in its flight, it was still able to get into space. And the other thing to, that I had to be concerned about was that it was draining fuel through that, um, through that docking adapter there. We didn't want that to end up without fuel. Once we got into orbit, we will try and get this to dock to the parent vehicle. But uh, that will, of course, be in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.